good morning sorry guys i just got a phone call from my mom so i had to answer that quickly but good morning um so ooh, fix my chair all right so i'm gonna jump in by showing you guys the things i'm gonna use just in case there are new people who are new to the group or who are new to watching it on youtube then i'm gonna do a quick prayer and we're gonna knock out these 10 verses um hopefully we can be done by 10:45. <laughs> So, um, the Bible I'm using is the New King James Journal of the Word Bible. I love the New King James translation. It's one of my favorite translations ever. This is from Thomas Nelson. This is the older um, edition of the Journal of the Word. I know they have a new edition that's called the Reference. This is just the older one that has no references in it. So, that is what I'm using. I still have my little piece of paper that I wrote all my notes on before. It's just from a notepad that I picked up from Staples, I believe, or Office Depot. Blue post it note for my definitions. I have the notes for Jonah 3 here. And then I have my utensils, which are the Pigma Micron 01 archival ink pen. This is a 0.25 millimeter. I have my basic G Flex oil gel pen. I use the Crayola Super Tip markers for highlighting as well as the mild liners from zebra for highlighting and the crayola twistable colored pencils <laughs> for highlighting and the sharpie highlighters these are the ones that don't have the clip i get them for like two or three bucks for my local rite aid and their smear guard so i have all of those and um i think that's it as far as everything that i have um I'm just trying to open up this at live. It's not letting me open. Okay, there we go. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to quickly just pray us in and then dive right into this. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for waking us up this morning. We thank you for allowing us to walk among the living, Father God. We thank you just for the life that you have given us, for the breath that you breathed into our bodies. I'm asking that you come into this study that we may be able to glean something from it so that we can apply it to our lives, Father God. Amen. Quick prayer. Uh, what is this? Oh, sorry, I just got a text <laughs> about Bible study at church. But, um, yes. So, I titled this for Jonah chapter 3, The Reluctant um, Obedience, because this is the chapter where we find that Jonah now is obedient to God, but he's very reluctant at the same time because he still doesn't want to go to Nineveh to preach. Chapter 1 was more so him running away from God and just disobeying. The second chapter was him um, being, I guess, punished in a sense in the belly of the fish. And now we are on chapter 3. So the way that I do this is I read through without marking anything the first time. The second time I go and I circle words that I want to define. The third time, I then go in and underline parts of phrases and parts of verses. Then I write my notes, and I box everything in that color because color makes everything look better, at least in my opinion. So, we're going to dive right into this. Normally, I read chapter, I'm not chapter, but um, I read like paragraph by paragraph, or in this case, it will be chapter by chapter because it's so short. So, I'm going to read the complete entirety of chapter 3 through. That way, we can just zoom on through. So, it says... Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and preach to it the message that I tell, tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent, and Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. When he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed. God proclaimed the fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid, his, laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes, and, it caused, and he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hand. Verse 9, who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that he, so that we may not perish. Final verse, then God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them and he did not 
do it. I hope you guys saw all of that. But, okay. So now, words that I want to circle. I'm just trying to get the definitions. So we have, in verse 4, we have overthrown. In verse 5, we have proclaimed and fast. Verse 7, we have published. Which is way over here in this corner. We have taste as well, which is in verse 7. I believe that's still in verse 7. Yes. Taste. And then the last word I have is going to be relent, which is in verse 9. So overthrown, proclaimed, fast, published, taste, and relent are the words that I've chosen. So here we have the definitions. So again, these are the Hebrew definitions with the Hebrew words. So overthrown is to turn and overturn. Proclaimed is to call. Fast is to abstain from food. Published is to utter or to say. Taste is to perceive. Relent is to be sorry of one's own doing. So those are the definitions in Hebrew. And I already wrote them out so that we wouldn't have to take too long for this. So I'm just going to now add color to everything so that I know what goes with which. I really like this green color for some reason. I'm not sure why. It's just a really pretty color. Which word is that? Published. Alrighty. So I have all of my definitions done. So I can just stick this sticky note over here. For the time being. move this out of my way and now we can dive into underlining and things like that so um i'm not sure if i'm gonna read any cross references today just because i don't have any of the my other bibles accessible to me right now <laughs> so um starting off with it says now the word of the lord came to jonah the second time i'm going to underline this Um, so this shows the amazing love of God to his wayward people. Though Jonah did everything he could to resist the first call of God, after Jonah repented, God called him again. Though God was under no obligation to do it, he did it out of mercy and grace. So basically, God was determined to do the work through Jonah, so he did not give up on the reluctant prophet. God is often just this committed to doing his work through a man. Your initial rejection of God's plan does not disqualify or excuse you from later service to him. So it sometimes people, um, especially I notice this a lot in the church where someone is asked to do something um, and it's like not giving so much so from like the pastor or the bishop of the church, but more so it's like the uh, apostle or the bishop or the pastor, whoever it is who's over the church, they're giving the um, minister or the evangelist or this person an assignment and the assignment comes from God so most of the time people don't want to do the assignment or they try to you know find ways around the assignment so when that happens you have people who are I guess in leadership positions that are higher up who get offended 
when you don't do things the first time. So they feel like you shouldn't get a second time. But um, just as Jonah got a second time, it's just like God will use you regardless if you um, reject him. Your rejection of God doesn't mean you're going to be disqualified and it doesn't mean he's not going to use you. That just means he has more work to do on you in order to use you for his purpose. So I just thought that was awesome that it said that, you know, he came to him a second time. So I'm just going to write your initial rejection of God's plan it does not disqualify or excuse you from later service. to God because a lot of times people like to use their excuses to say they what they can't do for God and how God won't use them but um God can still use you for his purpose but on his time obviously um so verse two it says preach it to the message that I tell you so instead of telling Jonah to cry out against Nineveh this time, God simply tells him to go there and to wait for further instruction. So I'm going to underline that I tell you. I'm going to grab my little note paper. I probably should write these notes on a different one. I just don't feel like I want to get no other paper. So I'm just going to use this one. Um, so verse 2. God tells Jonah to go and wait for... instructions and also with that um you know this story of jonah demonstrates why god so often leads us one step at a time without telling us more because when god told jonah that he would um what he would say and then if a jonah rejected the call so god often tells us what we can handle at that time um there's i'm pretty sure there's been a time where you've asked god to reveal um something to you and he's basically revealed it in almost in its entirety to you and it scared you. So the reason why God does things in baby steps is that um, it's, it's so that we don't become like Jonah and become disobedient and reluctant. Um, he wants us open and willing and he can only do that when he's giving us bits and pieces. And though I know for me, I get irritated when he gives me bits and pieces. It's just like, no, I want it all right now. But I know if he was to give me everything right now, it would scare me away. Like, honestly, I know it would. So, um, you know, this is just a reminder of why he gives things to us in small bits and pieces and um, takes his time with us instead of rushing us. Because for Jonah... To us, it doesn't seem like it was rushed, but maybe with Jonah's mentality and how he was raised and everything, it probably was um, like a rush kind of thing for him, which is what kind of frightened him. So moving on, verse three. So it says, Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. So having learned the lesson that resisting the will of God is both futile and counterproductive, Jonah now obeys the call and goes to Nineveh. Verse 4, it says, where is it? Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So Jonah has now emphasized to the people of Nineveh what would happen if they did not repent. Overthrown is a word that's applied to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the cross references I have for that um, are Genesis 19.25, Lamentations 4 and 6, and Amos 4 and 11. So I'm actually going to write all that out myself. So yet 40 days and 40. None of us shall be overthrown. So 
So again, Jonah emphasized to the people of Nineveh what would happen if they did not repent. So this is now him opening a segue for them to understand they're wrong and repent to God. And a lot of the times that's what we're supposed to do as um, believers and messengers for God. We're supposed to open up a way and light the path for people to ch now choose whether they want to repent or continue in their sinful ways. Nineveh was really known for their pagan ways and their um, just... I don't want to say abomination, but for the wrong that they did. And um, they did wrong because they didn't know right. And now that they had this prophet come, this reluctant prophet on top of that, come to um, kind of light the way for them. Now they see their wrongs and they immediately repented. There was no hesitance for them. So um, I'm just going to write that overthrown is a word. applied to the destruction and we all know about Sodom and Gomorrah went up in flames okay <laughs> if you don't know read that story but um pretty much Nineveh was warned and if they didn't listen they would have been basically destroyed just like Sodom and Gomorrah and again the cross references are Genesis 19:25 Amos 4.11. So moving on to verse 5, it says, So the people of Nineveh believed God. So for me, um, this really stuck out to me, especially with knowing what, um, about Nineveh back in verse... What verse was that? Mm, yeah, back in verse 2. For chapter one, because Nineveh was a pagan Gentile city. So, you know, repentance really begins with you believe in God. And as we believe him and his word, we then have the power to transform our lives as he wills. You can do many other things associated with repentance. But if they do not begin with believing on and trusting in God, they are all useless works of the flesh. You can't believe God apart from his word. Therefore, any real revival or repentance will begin with faithful preaching and faithful hearing of God's word, just as it was in Nineveh. So they were a pagan nation. They were a Gentile city. They did not know God because of a prophet, because this prophet came to them and told them basically in simple words, you know, yet 40 days, none of us shall be overthrown. And I'm pretty sure they knew who God was. They just didn't know him personally. Now they have this, um kind of open door to learn more about God and they instantly believed God like instantly believed him and turned from their ways which I find so profound so um so the people of Nineveh believed God I'm just gonna say repentance begins with believing and then it says they proclaimed the fast and then they put on sackcloth so the fact that they proclaimed the fast um, this is now telling me that repentance means doing something and the people of Nineveh didn't just believe God, but now they were taking action and fasting. And we all know that with fasting, you do fasting and prayer together. That way you are more in tune with God. That way you are closer to God. So the, these people were very adamant about um, getting to know God for themselves and um, turning from their ways and turning towards him. And then it says, put on sackcloth so they displayed their rejection of earthly comforts and pleasures by putting on this sackcloth um i'm pretty sure they were used to their fine fabrics and their you know the way they dress but they humbled themselves tore off their clothes and put on something that would reject um the earthly comforts and pleasures and i'm not sure how comfortable a sackcloth is i'm pretty sure it's not super comfortable so that just shows like they were very much um they, they they knew what they needed to do and they wanted to do it the right way. So, for the proclaim the fast, repentance, and 
means doing something. And then when they put on sackcloth, sackcloth, they displayed their rejection. Of earthly comforts and pleasures and I think it's also important to note um, that the fact that they did this it, it shows how much they wanted to put their flesh under um, subjection to God because I'm pretty sure being in a pagan city you're very fleshly you're very much in tune to your flesh and pleasing your flesh um, be it through expensive things or expensive um, or eating a certain way or having, you know, the sexual interactions they were having, being free to please their flesh. And now they're basically kind of stripping all of that away. So I thought that was awesome. Um, moving on to verse 6. It says, the word came to the king of Nineveh. So even the king of, um, I'm sorry, so even the king heard of the great words spoken by the prophet, which means that Nineveh may have already felt a pull to change, but were unsure of how to do so. And um, I'm not sure if any of you guys felt like this before you got saved or um, came to know Christ, but if you've ever felt like something was like pulling on your heart or pulling on your spirit, um, and you really didn't know what it was, you didn't know which way to turn, and then you had someone come and kind of shine some light i guess if you will say um onto what that was to help you realize what it was i feel like that's what kind of happened with nineveh especially since the king heard this and the king then you know went and did the same thing that his people did so i feel like they were already in a stage of changing they were just at that point in the road where they didn't know what to do or what they were feeling which is then why i believe god um told jonah to do what he did because you know we all read about god in the old testament how he will leave people to their own devices um but those people that he know has a, a willing heart he will open up a way for you to change in in essence so then it says um in verse six he arose from his throne so the king himself gave up his idols, his riches, and title to honor God. I think this is important to understand because we have many people in high positions that um, they take their, their titles to the next level. Like, they take their titles, they run with their titles, and they abuse their titles. But you have this king who gave up all of that. He gave up the idols, he gave up his riches, and he gave up his title so that God could be king of his heart. So I thought that was awesome. And then it said, laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. So again, he switched from his earthly clothing, which was drowned in wickedness, to clothing that symbolized repentance. He was now dressed in new garments that aligned with God. And I'm actually going to write that down for myself because I really thought that was um, amazing. Like this king just did everything he could to allow God to be king all over him and in his life. So this is still verse 6, so. He switched. Whoopsie. From his. Earthly clothing. Drowned wickedness to clothing that symbolized repentance. He was now dressed. I'm sorry if I'm writing so slow and speaking so slow. Dressed in new garments that aligned with God. 
Okay. So verse 7 says, Cause it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh. So now the king didn't just keep the good news for himself. He made sure that all his people knew of the news and would be held accountable of it. He wanted to ensure that all of the people that lived in his land were accountable to God and understood that they needed to um, repent and turn from their sin. So verse 8 It says, cry mightily to God. So, coming to God with passion and seriousness about your sin and your need for his mercy and forgiveness. Come to him. With passion and seriousness. about your sin and your need for his mercy and forgiveness. Yes, I know my handwriting looks like chicken scratch right now. I'm sorry. But, um, for me, I think that's something crucial that I personally wanted to remember because sometimes when I pray, I feel like my prayers aren't, I don't want to say truthful because everything that I pray is obviously from the heart, but there's a difference when you are really crying out to God in your prayer and then when you're just praying just to pray. Like there's definitely differences <laughs> in various prayers. Um, and I'm actually talking about this on my blog right now with the 40-day uh, prayer challenge. But, um, you know, I, I, I don't know how to explain it. Um, and I'm not, I'm, when I, I'm not comparing it to, like, those lazy kind of prayers when you're in the bed praying. I mean, like, I could sit here and pray right now for something simple. And I don't always have to put... Seri I, I don't know if seriousness is the right word. I hope you guys get what I'm saying. Oh my gosh. There's just, I don't, there's a difference um, between having passion and understanding how serious it is that you need to um, confess your sins and need his mercy and forgiveness versus just saying, Lord, forgive me. Um, I need your help kind of thing. Um, you know, I need your help. Forgive me is one thing. Whereas, you're actually crying out to him, telling him you need his mercy, you need his forgiveness, you need his compassion, you need his love. And you're being serious about the sin that you committed and you're now seeking um, his guidance to kind of fix it. I guess that's the, where I'm going with that. That That's it right there. <laughs> but um, good morning. But uh, okay, so... Verse 8 still, it says, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence. So this is basically the very meaning of repentance. It's the process of turning to God in a way from previous sinful actions. And the cross reference I have for that is going to be Isaiah 58 verse 6. So again, in verse 8, it says, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence. And that is the very meaning of repentance. It is the process of turning to God and away from previous sinful actions. And the cross-reference again is Isaiah 58 and 6. I'm just going to underline this for myself and write the cross-reference. I don't even know where I want to put that. I'll stick it up here, Isaiah. I don't like writing in Bibles when they're like this because I feel like my hand is like lopsided. <laughs> and then I have to like do all this extra work to turn the page the way I want it to. Um, okay, so verse 9. Oh, wow. That was fast. <laughs> verse 9. Um, it says, who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger? So basically, repentance has hope in the mercy and love of God. 
pretty much they were hope like with their repentance they had hope that god would be merciful and that his love would um allow them to not have to be punished the way he sought to punish them now don't get me wrong they were still punished apparently um i don't even know what book it was Nahum. Nahum, I think that's how you say it. So they still got their judgment, obviously, um, in Nahum. I, I I looked it up. It's quite interesting. But, um, yeah, I'll get to that in a second. But, yeah, okay. So <laughs> who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger? So repentance has hope and mercy in the love of God. The cross-references I have for that are Second Samuel 12 and 22 and Joel 2 and 14. And then it says, so that we may not perish. So they knew they were, um, they basically knew they had made an error, but thanks to the Holy Spirit, um, they wanted true life and not death. So because again of Jonah, despite his reluctance, um, he did what he, he did what God said. He got a second opportunity to, to obey God. He, he did it. Um, and he opened up the way, like I've been saying, for Nineveh to be able to repent and seek God for themselves and understand that they were wrong. Um, and it, I guess it, you could say it went well because the king himself um, kind of stripped himself of his title just to put himself before God. And then he declared it for all of the people of Nineveh to do the same thing. So I just thought that was important. Um, and I know I'm not personally underlining everything just because I have the notes here. But um, the things that I'm putting in here I feel are like very crucial. So what I'm going to do quickly is do some color right now because my eyesight is going wonky. Just looking at this. But um, yeah, I am totally enjoying the book of Jonah. I'm honestly learning so much from it. It's amazing i think jonah will be like one of those books i constantly study like once a year because it has so much knowledge in it and um there's a lot of things that i can grasp and i'm i'm pretty sure if i when i study it a second time there are going to be more things and new things that i'll learn I'm just throwing all my color on here right now. Because we literally only have one verse left, so. Let's use some gray. down to the final yep, the final verse okay so it says God saw their work and they turned from their evil way so basically he saw their hearts and not just their actions there was a heart change amongst the people in Nineveh so when we change our wills um, God's will Will's a change, if that makes sense. I'm going to say, God saw, can you guys see this? <laughs> God saw their hearts. And that's important because a lot of the times people do things just to do it for show. And they honestly believe that what they're doing and what they're pretending to show 
is um you know acceptable to god but god doesn't just look at your actions he also looks at your heart and if your heart doesn't align with your actions then he's not gonna you know forgive you he's not gonna help you or whatever the case may be there has to be something in your heart that changes um and allows god to really see you for who you are because your actions mean nothing there are so many people out here being nice but on the inside they're bitter they're evil they're conniving they're deceiving like they're just nasty to the bone so god is not going to help someone who's who's acting if you will or pretending to be nice if their hearts are twisted rather than helping someone who has done wrong who can have a nasty attitude at times but their heart is you know in a place or in a correct posture where he can do work he saw that these people had a heart that he could utilize and do work with so he decided to you know change his will now granted i don't want to consider it change because he still did judgment against them 150 years later but um you know he will delay certain things when your heart posture is in a right manner so god saw their hearts um and lastly it says God relented from the disaster. And I'll just write the last note on here. Where's my pen? I think I just lost my pen. And that's not good. <laughs> Oh, no, I didn't. It's right here. <laughs> Found it. So, verse 10. I'm going to use this purple for verse 10. It says, he relented from the disaster. And let me just use this mint. Okay. So yeah, um, God relented from the disaster. So basically, God honored their repentance, even though their past sin was just uh, was just enough reason for an outpouring of judgment. So we do not obligate God to forgive us when we repent. Instead, repentance appeals to God's mercy, not his justice. When we choose to repent, God may choose to relent. Again, the choice is up to him. I can repent for something and God can still pass judgment on me if he so chooses. Um, sometimes he will delay the judgment and that's basically what happened with Nineveh because their judgment was delayed by 150 years and you can read about their judgment in Nahum. I think that's how you pronounce that, <laughs> that book. I, I don't know how to pronounce that prophet's name, but Nahum, N-A-H-U-M. I think that's how you say that. Um, but yeah, so God honored their repentance even though their past was just enough For an outpouring of his judgment, God can relent if he chooses when we repent. And then the cross references are going to be Exodus 32, 14, Jeremiah 18, 7 through 8, Amos 7, 3, and verse 6. So again, God honored their repentance, even though their past sin was just enough for an outpouring of his judgment. 
We do not obligate God to forgive us when we repent. Instead, repentance appeals to his mercy, not his justice. When we choose to repent, God may choose to relent. And um, again, it's his choice. He doesn't have to relent on it. He can give the judgment, I mean, the ju the judgment <laughs> right then and there. Um, but I know some people, like I've actually come across some people who would repent <laughs> for certain things and then get upset when they would still get you know, I guess punishment in a sense or judged by God for their sins. And it's just like, you can't get upset because uh, you did something that was wrong. Now, depending on your heart posture and everything with this Christian walk and Christianity is really about your heart, your heart posture. Um, you can do anything that this Bible is telling you to do. Like everything that this Bible tells you, you can do it. But it's a matter of how you're doing it. And how open to God you are when you're doing it. Um, you don't want to do things in a spirit of um, reluctance. You don't want to do things in a spirit of um, is a spirit of insensitivity. Is that is that a right right way to say it? I don't know. You just want to do everything in a spirit of excellence with the right heart posture. Um, and when you're not doing it that way, God can choose whether or not he wants to give you judgment, if he wants to relent on that, if he wants to, you know, he, he he's sovereign. I mean, it's, it's as simple as that. Um, Nineveh is just an example of a pagan Gentile city that was forgiven. Granted, I guess down the line, they continued doing whatever they wanted to do back, you know, when gener other generations were born. Um, but obviously they were judged for that. So... I mean, it, I don't really know what else to say about it. It's, you know, God just being God. But, um, yeah, that's pretty much it for Chapter 3. I did that in 40, 44 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, that is Chapter 3. We will tackle Chapter 4 next week. It's the last chapter. Uh, hold on. Awesome, Stacy. Awesome. Kimberly, yeah, I definitely can agree with you on that. Um, it took me a while to want to study the Bible myself. Like, I was, I'm, when I grew up in church, um, I, I was always in church. I grew up in the church. That's just, you know, what it was. Um, I got baptized, I think, about, like, 10 or something like that, 10, 11. I honestly can't remember. I think I want to get re-baptized just because I don't remember when I was last baptized, honestly. But, um, you know, as a kid, I enjoyed like Sunday school for some reason. Sunday school was something I always enjoyed. But um, if I wasn't in Sunday school, I wasn't reading my Bible. I wasn't studying the word. And I stayed away from the Old Testament. One, because I grew up on the King James. So I understand the King James now as an adult. But as a kid, one, I didn't understand it. And two, God always seemed like an angry God that was punishing people personally to me as a kid. Like he was setting people on fire. He was doing floods. There was a lot of people dying slavery like you know there was a lot as a kid and I was just like no I don't want to read it and then when I got older it's just like why do I have to read it because I felt like the old testament had nothing to do with me but you know with the whole depression thing and situations um that I went through I got to a point where I was just fed up with being in the state that I was in and I finally like dove into the word I think the first thing that I studied no but yeah the first book in the old testament that I studied was either Ruth or Esther I honestly can't remember, um, but it was either Ruth or Esther, and those two really um, sparked something in me. I've always read through Proverbs and Psalms as like a kid because that was something that my church and my mom always told me to do, but I didn't read through it um, with intent on studying, um, and a lot of people think because they read their word that they're like understanding the word, but there's a difference between reading the word and studying studying the word because when you're reading the word you're just understanding the context when you're studying it you're, you're you're really pulling out things that you can apply to your life you're looking at you know greek and hebrew definitions you're looking at the metaphors you're you're, you're looking at the imagery like you're really diving deep and when you actually take the time to study the scriptures it it just i don't know it just is profound it leaves you with this feeling in your heart that um it's, it's kind of like when the sun rises <laughs> and it sounds so stupid but um for me it's kind of like when i'm studying the scriptures versus reading reading the word i feel like there's a, a sun a sunrise happening in my heart i don't know how to you know 
I don't know if you've ever been in front of um like on a beach when the sun is coming up and how the 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 heat can kind of like warm you up again this might sound stupid but that's how I feel <laughs> when I'm reading the word like not reading excuse me when I'm studying the word yeah the King James is definitely um one of those that just it's very Shakespearean to me and I, I like Shakespeare a lot <laughs> So I think that's why I can understand it now as an adult, um, because I do kind of like that old kind of language. But that's why I trans, um, not translated. <laughs> that's why I switched over to the new King James, because it's literally the King James just without all the wither, wither thou and thy and all, I, anything with the TH is cut out in the new King James. So I prefer the new King James. Um, I do enjoy the CSB, the ESV. Um, I love the Amplified, like, I love a lot of different translations, but I feel like the New King James for me is, like, my staple translation, um, just because it stays true to the King James. Now, I do want to get, um, I think it's an NASB, because I think that's more of a literal translation, if I'm not mistaken, of the actual, like, Hebrew and Greek text, but, um, yeah, I don't know, it's just something about studying the Word of God, it just makes me feel good. Like, really, I could be in, like, a very distraught kind of emotion, feeling, mood, and then I can read the word and actually study it and pull it apart, and then I start to feel better. Um, and I'm actually shocked with how much I'm actually getting out of Jonah, because growing up as a kid, all you knew was that Jonah was ate by a whale. I don't know who even came up with the idea that he was a whale, like the fish was a whale. It could have been, like, a regular fish that got enlarged. I don't know. If someone could tell me who came up with the idea that Jonah was in the belly of a whale. But, um, you know, I'm I'm really learning a lot. And when I was putting this uh, Bible study together, I was, I was honestly shocked by how impactful the book of Jonah is. And it, it, again, this reminds me of Ruth. Ruth is the same kind of setup with just four small, four, four small short chapters. Um, but it's very, very impactful when you actually take the time to study it. So awesome. I, I, I really want an NASB Bible so bad. Like I really do. I just don't think I need any more Bibles. <laughs> now granted, I use each and every single one of my Bibles. Like they don't sit there on my shelves, but I just feel like I don't need it right now. Cause I don't have a lot of storage space. But I really, really want one, and I really, really want to amplify it. Like, those are the two translations that I really, really want. I, I, I really want. I want an NASB that's a study Bible, and then for the Amplified, I just, I don't know if I want, like, a regular, like, reading Amplified Bible, or if I want a studied am study Bible that's Amplified. But I know for the NASB, I definitely, definitely want it to be a, um, a study Bible. So, I don't know. I'm still looking around to see which one I want. But I, I don't I don't need any more Bibles. I really don't. But um yeah, that is it for this. If you're watching this on YouTube, sorry for rambling on. <laughs> but uh yeah, that is it. Or let me stick this in here. Chapter three. And we only have one more week next week to do chapter four and we'll be done with Jonah. And, yeah, that's it for this video. So, if you have any comments, questions, or anything, um, just leave them in the Facebook group. Because, I am I need, again, like I said in the last video, I need to make a habit of um, re-watching my live videos. Because I know a lot of you guys post comments and stuff, and I don't even check them. So, I need to make that a habit of re-watching my live videos every day or every week or so. But, um, yeah, I'm going to end it here. I'm going to go have me an iced coffee right now. Because I have BSF in like 10 minutes. Yes. So yeah. I'll see you guys in the next Bible study. Bye.